Hi everybody. Um, I'm shortly going to be doing a breakdown of the FIA report into Abu Dhabi, which they spent about two and a half months producing and then released upon the world um, on the eve of the start of the 2022 season. Um, but before I do so, I need to go through a series of about four or five videos that I'm going to produce um, all leading up to that report and they're all relevant. Um, I've already done this one in that um, it's an analysis of what Brundle presented the day after Abu Dhabi. So he did this on the 13th of December 2021. Now um, if I just come out of this and go to this tab here um, it's saying about five months ago I produced these couple of videos which many of you will have seen um, this one saying um, you know put that on the uh, thumbnail Brundle finished um, this is where I've broken down this video already but that video is 54 minutes long so I'm going to try and make this one shorter um, however there's a good chance that what I'm going to say this time I'm going to be picking up even more things than last time because this is the nature of all of this. Um, you've seen me go through those last five laps of Abu Dhabi multiple times. And each time we can all pick out different things and we can all understand the uh, importance of the little things that we can then pick out each time. So likewise with this clip, um, it's around about a nine minute video. That you can all see on uh, on YouTube, but I could do this video probably five or six times and pick out different things each time. I'm going to try and keep it fairly short, but show you the true nature of it and show you the lies that Brundle's telling you. But this is important, and the reason it's important, Sky Sports produced five, six, seven, maybe even more um, videos like this to put out there to validate Abu Dhabi and condition fans to accept it. And you need to listen at what is put out in these videos because when you get to then analyze the FIA report, you'll see what is in the FIA report. So there is a purpose to this. Um, the other one that I've already done is uh, Crofty when uh, he um, tries to explain to us um, his version of the rules and explain the safety car rules. So again, that one was five months ago as well. And many of you will have seen that. Um, I will try and do a shorter version of that. If anybody um, can find um, an interview conducted uh, on Sky Sports where Karun Chandok actually makes the comment because i specifically remember him saying this um karun chandok gives his opinion validates it all in in every way that he can and makes the statement uh there were still uh other series of events whereby max could have all, also won i remember him saying that and then i remember those same words being parroted by the BBC's Andrew Benson when Benson was writing about it for the BBC in the aftermath of the event. So if anybody can find that specific video for me and send me a link to it, that's one too that I would like to do an analysis of. Uh, but at the moment, I can't find that on YouTube. So whether whether some of these things have been deleted, it really does not surprise me because um, quite a few things have. Anyway. I'm going to start the video um, from the beginning and stop it at various points and take you through the analysis and the breakdown and point out what Brundle's saying. And as I say, keep these things in mind because when it comes to the FIA report, you'll, you'll start uh, seeing a, a bigger picture. Okay, now here's the other thing. Uh, oh, Martin, thanks for... I don't know who this guy is. Um, some Sky Sports news presenter. Don't know who he is. Look at the nature of his questions. 
their loaded scripted questions designed to lead people a certain way they're not they're not normal questions in the aftermath of any sporting event or anything that's happened that's controversial um generally the questions asked are open questions not leading questions look at the nature of these questions look at the words that you use it's not natural it's not natural anyway here we go for joining us everybody has been talking about this so 24 hours or so on what are your thoughts on what happened so as i say 24 hours on from the most controversial sporting event that's still being talked about over 18 months after the event and it's still there's many of us that are still outraged by it and actually if everybody understood it there'd be millions more outraged by it than actually are if people knew the truth about this globally there would be outrage well it was an incredible few minutes of sport wasn't it um with a very grave consequences if you were lewis hamilton and mercedes benz uh, and an amazing experience if you were max verstappen and red bull okay refers to it as sport um sport isn't sport when it is contrived um and then he says um grave consequences if you're mercedes and lewis um amazing experience if you're verstappen and red bull now if you are a true sportsman if you play sport you know what authentic achievement feels like it's not an amazing achievement if you know that what has happened isn't real. So those people who celebrate that kind of event, it shows a lot about their character. It shows about the caliber of individuals that those people are. So Christian Horner, Max Verstappen, Jonathan Wheatley, Adrian Newey, you know what you are. You know what you are. Um, very complex uh, matter. So it was so... Okay. We have in front of us the expert of the sport. So when you ask the expert of a sport to give their analysis of the most controversial event, they should be capable of clearly defining what went, what, what happened, what was right about it, what was wrong about it, and what the options are, or what, how to resolve it, what the way forward is. Martin Brundle is that person in Formula One, or he's the person put in front of us as that person. With 12 years experience as a driver, and at that time, 26 years experience as a pundit, of which he's been the chief kind of presenter stroke pundit for a long period of time so that's 38 years of experience in the sport I would suggest that that is long enough to be considered the expert in that and he is just saying oh, oh yeah it's it's really complex exciting uh, to it a wonderful finale to a wonderful uh, Grand Prix season. But then, of course, you know, there's a lot of controversy around it and it's all a bit uncomfortable and doesn't shine a particularly good light on Formula One and its pro. It's all a bit uncomfortable and doesn't shine a good light. So why is that? Processes, um, but it was a hugely complex and compressed moment in you know and several regulations were tripping over themselves look at martin brundle's eyes where they are is he he might be looking at what he thinks is his web camera or is he reading something is he making sure that he's reading from the script of validation now so and we ended up with a bit of a hybrid solution there which is why just going to rewind this a little bit and, um, but it was a hugely complex and compressed moment in, you know, and several regulations were tripping over themselves. And we ended up with a bit of a hybrid solution there, 
which is why the lawyers are getting involved and uh, inter. Right. Rules and regulations don't trip over themselves. They're clear. They've got a clear purpose. They're clear cut. I'm not presented to anybody as the expert of the sport. I've been a spectator and follower of this sport for somewhere in the region of 35 to, I don't know, 37 years. Something along them lines. From a child through to an adult. I've been following the sport. I know what the rules are. I know why they are what they are. I can explain them to you, which I have done and demonstrated it clearly with evidence in many of my other videos. There is no hybrid solution. And then he goes on to present, and I can clearly do that quite simply. And Martin is not doing that. And then he goes on to present, which is why the lawyers are getting involved. As if to say that this is something that is going to um, be argued about in court because it's so ambiguous, it's not clear cut. And you could present one argument or another argument and it's nothing like that. It's very, very clear and it's very, very simple. So why are you trying to suggest otherwise? And the reason being, you are trying to get people to accept it. You're trying to condition people to believe that it's not clear cut, that it is complex, that it is difficult to understand. And therefore, you know, we don't want to end up in this situation where it's arguments and a judge has to decide which, which side of the, the argument he's going to come down on. It's nothing like that. It's really clear cut. The rules are there for a purpose and there are, there are severe consequences of sporting fairness by not applying them correctly. And that has evidenced. But you're not even mentioning that. You're not mentioning the implications of breaking the rules. Instead, you're suggesting it was possible for a hybrid solution. There's no hybrid solution of any rules ever in any sport. Interpretation of wording in, in the regulations. And of course, you know, the, the sporting regs are 99 pages and you need to read every single word carefully. It's like a legal. No, you don't. Those people that follow the sports of football, uh, cricket, pick a sport that you're interested in. If you've been watching that sport for any period of time, you know what the rules of that sport are. You don't need to read all of the rules and the regulations of that sport to know what is going on. And you don't witness something in that that you've never seen before in that sport and then find yourself in a situation where one team decides we'll get the rule book out and we'll say, you know what, we have decided that this rule here can be interpreted a different way because this word here in this sentence here can mean something else. So we say that that actually can mean that way, which enables us to win. It doesn't happen, does it? Because there is an acceptance of what the rules mean, what their purpose is, and how that rule is applied for that purpose. So this notion of seeking to interpret a rule a different way is entirely corrupt. Do you think that that was done during that supposedly high pressured situation in those last couple of laps of Abu Dhabi? Do you think Jonathan Wheatley dug out the rule book, went through all the rules regarding the safety car, went through all the wording of the rules with them say about the safety car, maybe got his barrister there with him and decided, oh, um, oh, this word here, um, any, we could suggest that that doesn't mean all. And if we do that, we can um, encourage the race director to interpret this rule 
in a different way altogether. Never before interpreted that way in the sport. Forget the international sporting code that deals with sporting fairness in the sport. We'll, we'll present this argument and that should work because that will work for us. Do you think Jonathan Wheatley did that in the heat of the moment under pressure? What a cool guy he is. Or do you think that this was all done in advance? Because F1 TV seemed to know what was happening and what to focus on. Sky Sports F1 in the form of Martin Brundle and David Croft, who were calling it real time, seemed to know what to say and what to focus on to draw viewers' attention and thoughts into what was possible, which, in accordance with the rules, wasn't. So, you don't have to read the rules to every letter of them to know the sport. It's all a lie that he is trying to gaslight and confuse people by saying, yeah, I've not read the rules, maybe, maybe I don't know. You do know. You've not seen it before. You know it happens. Now, they've not told you why. That's their failing. They've not told you why for a reason. And it started in 2019 that I remember Martin Brunner, I can evidence it, the 2019 Spanish Grand Prix, the year that Charlie Whiting died, Brundle began lying to people about the safety car rules. Good document. And the sporting code, which backs everything up, is, you know, that sort of thick. And it's just, it's a minefield. Um, and in the heat of the moment... Like I say, the expert of the sport should not be describing the rules of the sport and the regulations and the underlying sporting ethics of the sport that underpins it all as a minefield. Um, it's not a minefield, minefield. Why would he be calling it a minefield? It's not. Nothing is. This is what we're going to compete in, okay? We are, in, are going to engage in the sport. This outlines the rules that we are going to all compete under. So that everybody's aware of them. We all know what we're doing. We all accept them. And that sets the parameters for what's acceptable and what isn't within the context of competition. That's what happens in sport. You don't write them so that they're a minefield. Why are you trying to suggest that they are, Brundle? It's absolutely ridiculous. When, when uh, Michael Massey, the race director, had to consider the safety of marshals, was the car out of the way? He couldn't release the cars until he was, uh, the lapped cars until he was certain that the track was reasonably clear, although they... Okay, so you're describing the race director's job. You know, he's got to do this, he's got to do that. Yes, okay. And then you say he couldn't release them until the track was reasonably clear well it's not about reasonably clear the clack the track after an instant has to be declared safe so it has to be clear from the crash car clear from the debris and the barriers have to be checked to ensure that they're safe so that if there's a, a, a repeat incident with another car then barriers are capable of performing the same job again to keep that driver as safe as possible okay it's not about Oh, is it reasonably clear? Can we do it now? No. Them checks have to be done. It's health and safety. Okay? It's like the concussion checks, which are now mandatory in many sports. These things have to happen. They, of course, have to proceed with caution anyway. And you know what? Even knowing who the lap cars are is not as straightforward as you might think because uh, you get a safety car situation and some cars pit, and that means they are then lapped, or the leader pits uh, and unlaps some other cars. So it, it takes a certain amount of time to work out exactly who the lapped runners are, where they are in the pack. But the fundamental point of that rule is to make sure that they don't get in the way of a great of a great duel towards the end of a Grand Prix. And that's only all that was lies. So 
what you have is you have data view. We've had that going back on F1 TV to 2019. That clearly states which cars have been lapped. If you're telling me they don't use that technology in race control, what is this sport doing? It is quite clear who has been lapped because all you do is you look at the leader and then you look at the train of cars who's behind him. Well, who was behind Lewis Hamilton? Well, that was Lando Norris. And after Perez retirement, Norris was in seventh position. So if seventh position has been lapped, everything below seventh has also been lapped. It's quite simple. And then he goes on to explain scenarios which didn't take place. Well, if the leader uh, goes into the pits, some cars may open up their sides. Well, did Lewis pit? No. So that didn't happen, did it? So don't try and confuse the situation with that. And some cars go into the pits and then get lapped. Again, did anything like that happen? Did any car go into the pits and get themselves lapped while they're in there? No. The likes of Gasly and Sonoda went into the pits for their tyre change after a couple of laps of lapping behind the safety car, giving themselves enough of a window to get in and out before that safety car train came round. That's what they do. So that is another thing that you've tried to throw in to confuse people. And then finally, you cap it off by saying, and the fundamental point of that rule is so that the lapped cars don't get in the way of a great duel at the end of a race. And that certainly happened, didn't it? And that is absolutely not the fundamental. It's not any in any way. It's nothing to do with being the fundamental. It is not in any way the purpose of the unlapping procedure. Not in any way. It is entirely to restore sporting fairness to every competitor in that event. So that the only way of validly restarting that event, that race, is for them cars to be line astern in the correct order. First, down to the last remaining running competitor. And give them the opportunity for them to all be bunched up so that the gaps in between each car is the same at the restart. So they've all got the same chance to both attack the car in front, but also have somebody behind them that can challenge them. That is the fundamental purpose of it. If you don't do that, you are skewing outcomes and you are doing that off the back of a safety incident, which is not fair to all competitors, hence the rules being what they are. Hence the rules being underpinned by the FIA International Sporting Code. It's very simple and you're lying about that. That's an absolute lie that you've just come out with. And this is on top of the gaslighting that you're continually doing. It happened, didn't it? It clearly did. You mentioned there about kind of the legal battles and... Listen to this question. Such like, how sad would you be to see this all decided at some point in a courtroom? How sad would you be to see all this decided in a courtroom? You know, I spoke about open questions or leading questions. What sort of a question is that? How sad would you be if you to see all this decided in a courtroom, Martin? How sad would you be? Uh, it'd be it would be terribly sad. And oh, yes, it would be terribly sad. Why would it be terribly sad, Martin? Surely, as somebody who loves sport, you would want to see the right outcome, the right sporting outcome. Why would, why would achieving the right sporting outcome sadden you? I don't understand. I really do not understand why. Because let's, let's, let's be, be clear what the purpose of a court process is. It is to determine what is right and what is wrong. That is the purpose of law. Is to determine what is right and what is wrong. And you would you it would be terribly sad, would it, Martin, to see that happen? 
for, for right or wrong to actually be determined. That would sadden you. Why? Why would that be? Because that doesn't sadden people of integrity. We can accept what's right. If it might not be what we want in terms of what we would like to happen. You know, if, if I was a Lewis Hamilton fan and that race could have validly restarted and um, Mercedes had made a wrong call, if they'd have thought it could have restarted, there's a good chance that they might have put him on fresh tyres too. But they made their call based on the, the rules of the sport. That was the right call because the rules of the sport dictated that the race shouldn't restart. But then they broke the rules to restart it. OK. But in a scenario whereby had all the rules applied and an outcome occurred that wasn't my preferred outcome, could I accept that? Of course. OK. I wouldn't be saddened by a court ruling that, by a court determining that. I'll give you an example. England had just played Australia in the second Ashes test of the 2023 summer. And one of the England batsmen was um, gotten out by the Australians in what was deemed a controversial manner. Um, he left his crease, Johnny Bairstow left his crease um, because he, it was the last ball of the over, the sixth ball of the over. Um, so he kind of tapped his foot in his crease to almost eight, right, I'm in my ground, now I'm walking out. But the Australian uh, wicketkeeper um, caught the ball, having it travelled through to him, he threw it straight back at the stumps, and Bairstow had walked out of his crease and was given out. The Australians appealed, the umpire um, referred it to the off-field umpire, and according to the rules of the sport, because the umpire hadn't declared the over as being fully over at that stage, Bairstow was given out. Now, you look at the rules of the sport, Bairstow is out. The umpire hadn't said that's the over finished. Bairstow made the assumption. There's a general underlying um, kind of sporting code amongst players whereby there's an acknowledgement of this is, you know, he, he's checked himself, he's, he's gone, right, that's the over, I've, I've checked myself in before marching off. So there is that debate as to, was it ethically the right thing to do? Okay, but that comes down to um, how people want to conduct themselves as individuals. But were rules broken? No, they weren't. So whilst as an Englishman, I wasn't particularly happy about it, were rules broken? The answer is no. And therefore, I'm, I, I, I'm not in any way looking to challenge that. I'm not going to go and make YouTube videos about that, complaining about that. OK, that's just part and parcel of what some of these things happen. This is entirely different. This is entirely different. This is breaking the rules of the sport. And this is also um, parties conspiring to do so and, and i i can't really see where it can go if i'm honest because you know what's the remedy you know for example red bull didn't do anything wrong there are no misdemeanors on their part or okay they did they lobbied the race director to um, perform a procedure which wasn't in accordance with the rules of the sport wasn't in accordance with the International Sporting Code. They then went to the stewards appeal where Mercedes would appeal after the race and presented a case which was entirely wrong. And the stewards from the FIA agreed with them. They sided with Red Bull. So yes, they did do a lot wrong there. They did do a lot wrong. Carlos Sainz coming in third for Ferrari, for example, Yuki Tsunoda for AlphaTauri. How are you going to unravel all of that? You can't just suddenly count back a lap. You absolutely can. And 
quite simply to unravel that the race result becomes the running order behind the safety car and the running order counted back the previous lap so you can declare it either at the end of lap 56 or as they cross the line because you're not allowed to overtake before you've crossed the line so as they cross the line at the start of lap 57 either way in fact, because Massey broke the rules on lap 57 by only releasing five of the eight lapped cars, you have to declare the race result as, as the running order at the end of lap 56. That's valid. Because what he did on lap 57 wasn't. So that's what you do. And there has been races in the past where they've thrown a red flag and the race result is declared as the race order at the end of the previous lap to the lap that the red flag is thrown at. I believe Monaco, uh, I don't know the year, but it's when um, Senna was blitzing his way through everybody in the rain. Prost was leading and Senna was well on his way to overtaking Prost. And Prost was waving his hands because he didn't like the conditions. And the Frenchman, who was the head of the FIA at the time, um, decided that they were going to end the Monaco Grand Prix before Senna got a chance to overtake Prost. So they did so. Um, Senna thought he'd won, and they counted back to the end of the previous lap. So there's various times that this sort of thing has happened. And in terms of setting a precedent, well, if something unprecedented happens as the governing body it's your role your job your responsibility to set the precedent and that is to say this is what's happened this is what it then generated and that is not okay and the reason it's not okay is because of blah 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 and blah and i can give you all of them reasons that being mercedes will have made their strategy calls in accordance with the rules of the sport. If you change them rules, it negates that strategy call. Every other competitor was impacted in each of these ways, which I've also described in my other videos. We cannot allow for each competitor to be impacted in that way. Hence, we cannot allow the what that actually produced to stand, because it is invalid. We must apply the rules of the sport. They, they are applied uniformly to all competitors, that everybody knows what they are, understands them, and that they are the rules that the sport is conducted within. And therefore, this is what we have to do. This is the result of the race. Quite simple. Because I don't think there's any precedent or regulation to suggest that. Um, what should have happened is we should have had a red flag so that then the mess could get ridiculous option okay not not in any way an option uh, wasn't the type of circumstance that dictate a red flag cleared away of the accident uh, drivers could then choose their tires and there would have been a three lap shootout towards it's not a three lap shootout it's a grand prix which was a, a an event contested over 58 laps what you saw during the 56 valid laps, was that Lewis Hamilton dominated. He had built up a lead of 12 seconds, with just five of those laps to go. And barring getting a puncture or crashing out, and the evidence says neither of those things happened, Lewis Hamilton was well on course to win that event and become world champion. It is not a, oh, let's cancel all of that and let's instead just decide this with a three-lap sprint. It's not what it is. Let's have a world marathon championship and let's, let's do marathons in every big city of the world. And when it comes down to it, oh, oh at the last one, um, rather than finish the marathon, the two guys that could win the championship, let, let's just do a 100 metre sprint race instead. That's not what it is. The competition is over a marathon. 
So let's not contrive it to be any other way. It's not anything but that. To the end, um, strictly speaking, the regulations suggest that they say. Strictly speaking. Why are you almost trying to suggest that it's flexible? You know, well, you know, the, I guess it should be that, but it could be that. No, not at, not at all. Look at the way you're wording this, strictly speaking. How about you say, the rules dictate this. Safety car should have completed the next lap. And in fact, the regulations do allow for, if it's going to be a safety... The regulations do allow for, the regulations dictate car finish in, in other words the, an accident just cannot be cleared away in time the safety car pulls in the pits there can be no overtaking so the glorious shot uh, for the world to see on the tv and the, the photographers is not of a safety car with its lights blaring away with the, with the winner behind it but a racing car and a racing driver so all sorts of provisions in there and to say we ended up with a bit of a hybrid of all that and it you know you can look at it and argue that it played so heavily into Red Bull's hands uh, at that point that it was that it was unfair. But then Red Bull played. Some so once again, we ended up with a hybrid of all that. And you could argue that it played into Red Bull's hands. You could argue that. Is, is that what you could argue, is it, Martin? You can't just state that that's entirely what it did. That's exactly what everything did. Because I've proven that everybody else was disadvantaged. Everybody else was disadvantaged. Some clever cards with their strategy, perhaps on the... Wasn't clever cards with a strategy, okay? It's not clever cards with your strategy if in a Grand Prix, you, with five laps to go, a 12 seconds behind the lead car with no chance of catching them. That's not clever cards with strategy. Making the call to put him on fresh tyres as a gamble, if it was possible to restart the race in accordance with the rules, well, do you not think that if there was the chance of it restarting, Mercedes would have made the same call? Or do you not think that their strategists who know the rules of the sport and know the data as to what the likelihood is of that restart, do you not think that was a clever call? Do you not think they were clever cards? In the first virtual safety car, Mercedes-Benz were a little bit too cautious, leaving them 44 laps to go on a set of tyres. So would Lewis Hamilton have won? Simple, simple answer. Yes, he would. You know, there was some clever strategy going on, but then Red, Red Bull had nothing to lose. Hamilton had the speed and had the lead. And so Red Bull had... You know, you've, you said this during the race. We, 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 we're conditioned to this. Well, Red Bull did nothing wrong. Red Bull played some clever cards. Red Bull had nothing to lose. We're continually hearing this, aren't we? We're continually hearing this. And 18 months on, we're continually seeing something about Red Bull, aren't we? Hmm. Plenty of space behind them and, and grabbed a couple of safety car stops. So that's the way the cookie crumbled. Martin, there was loads of, let's call them new Formula One fans watching yesterday. Can you see the positive that, right, they've, they've had all that drama and we're still talking about it now. So maybe that keeps them interested. But the rules have been so complicated. A lot of people don't really understand still what actually happened yesterday. It's, there is talk of court and such like. And those new ma fans might just think, actually, Formula One is so complicated, I've lost interest already. Again, look at the nature of the, this guy's questions. OK, look at what he says. And then we'll play that through again. Let's listen. <laughs> is this a normal question? Let's call them new Formula One fans watching. Yeah, I don't call them that. I'll call them uh, 
Tango Whiskey Alpha Tangos. But uh, here we go. Yesterday, can you see the positive that, right, they've, they've had all that drama and we're still talking about it now, so maybe that keeps them interested. But the rules have been so complicated. A lot of people don't really understand still what actually happened yesterday. It's, there is talk of court and such like, and those new ma fans might just think, actually, Formula One is so complicated, I've lost interest already. I think we had over nine, nine million people watching it on TV yesterday. And uh, so that's, that'd be in the UK uh, on Sky, whether that, that includes the Channel 4 viewers who were showing it uh, live as well uh, for free. We were told the global audience was around about 108 million, of which the Sky Sports coverage and the commentary team of Brundle would have been a, a significant proportion of that, I believe. And the, the audiences are growing. Formula One's had an incredible year. It was a bit complicated and, and incredibly controversial. Um, but I don't... It was a bit complicated. Uh, so you can't explain that to us, Martin? You can't clarify the situation. Instead, you just palm it off by just saying, "Yeah, it was it was a bit complicated," and you know most people won't understand that. But yeah, it was it was exciting, and I think the viewers will be retained. Yeah, it's all complicated. Don't worry about that bit. But as long as you're excited, you'll keep watching, won't you? Is that what this is? Is that what it is? Is that what you're reliant on? Is that what you're doing to this sport? Because it's not sport when you're doing this to it. It's filthy. We know that it's contrived. Okay? We know that it's a global marketing roadshow. That's all it is. That's the only reason that Liberty Media bought the, um, what do they call them? the it's not the media rights is it the um marketing rights to formula one from eccleston why would you buy the marketing rights to a sport well the reason you'd buy something like that is because you thought it was an investment you thought you could make money out of it so you're marketing this how do you make money well what it is you attract a bigger audience and you get people to to want to buy into your sport as sponsors so that their their brand gets seen by a large global audience so that's all you care about money that's all that liberty media care about is money and therefore they don't care about sport they don't care about sporting ethics even though they're bought a sport or the rights to a sport they don't care about sport. They care about how much money they can make out of it and what they can do to attract fans. And what they've done, they've fixed it. They've contrived it to attract fans, to make more drama, to hype things up, to make a new face of the sport. And there'll be other motives as well. That's what they've done. They've lied about it. They've got these people to lie about it. They've got their TV company to present it in a certain way. And therefore, it's attracted this new breed of fan that doesn't know, doesn't know what they're talking about, hasn't really got a clue, but are excited by fast cars and expensive brands and this aspirational lifestyle. Wow, fast moving, Formula One cars, crashes, expensive brands, yachts. Cool people, living the dream, living your best life. This is all Formula One. But they don't know what it is, really. They don't know anything about motor racing, what's acceptable and what isn't, why, why the rules are what they are. Because Sky Sports don't tell them. And in most sports, those people responsible for presenting and commentating on them sports clearly educate fans with the rules of the sport through their commentary, they explain things. They tell people the reasons behind why things are what they are. Sky Sports don't do that. Sky Sports F1 don't do that. There's a reason. Why has nobody broken down the safety car rules 
and expose them in the way that I have on my channel. There's a reason for that. They're quite happy to keep people in the dark. They're quite happy for people to not know. Because by people knowing, it exposes this. They're quite happy to keep the thick new fans of the sport just fed with drama and excitement because they're happy with that. They'll keep buying that. Whoa, yay. We like that. That's exciting. Give me the next 15 second TikTok that's going to amuse me about F1. Oh, yeah, don't worry about the rules. Don't worry about the rules. They're, they're too complicated for you. Just, 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 just focus on the crashes and the fun bits. Yay. I don't think it'll put people off watching Formula One. I think I think it'll engage them more into it, if I'm honest. But we, we do we do need some clarity, but it's an incredibly fast moving, complex, highly technical sport. And um I'm afraid you can write another hundred pages of regulations, but once again, it's incredibly complex. Oh, none of you will understand. Okay, Martin, thanks for that. All right. And what he's gonna say now? There will still be circumstances that are just not covered in it and it and it's like in any you know football right you don't need to write a set of rules and regulations to cover the things that aren't allowed you say what the rules are if things fall outside of that you apply the existing rules to that situation it's quite simple well that doesn't conform to the rules so therefore that's not allowed you haven't got to write a whole new set of rules to say what's not allowed <laughs> rules aren't like that. The rules of football don't say, "Oh, well, you can't, you can't." The goalkeeper can't pass the ball to the right fullback. The right fullback pick the ball up with his hands, run the length of the pitch, and then throw the ball into the back of the net, and it's a goal. You don't have to write that rule because one of the existing rules actually is enough to show you that that's not allowed. So you don't need to write this hundred extra pages, Martin. Dickhead. Or cricket, rugby, or whatever. There's, there's, at some point, there's a judgment call by somebody. Uh okay. This is not a judgment call in any way. Breaking the rules is not a judgment call. Knowingly contravening the rules, knowing the outcomes that are generated by doing that is not a judgment call in any way. That procedure is there for a reason. It is there to guarantee sporting fairness or to try and ensure sporting fairness to every competitor in that event. Massey knows that. Massey's proved that on the four occasions where he's actually kept the safety car out lapping for an additional lap to ensure that those released lapped cars made it all the way around the track to get to the back of the safety car train. He wouldn't do that if he didn't know the rules. Now, anybody wants to argue otherwise, you're arguing corruptly. Massey knows the rules. He knows the purpose of the rules. Therefore, when you break them like that, you know what you are doing. You know what you are creating. And you know that it's invalid. And, um, you know, I, I think we... we from, uh, I've said for years, for example, that lap runners should fall back, back to the pack and not, not have to go out front and get round again. Right, we're not interested in what your opinion is of what you think the rules should be, Martin, because they're not the rules, are they? And actually, that's the reason that they don't do that is because what you're doing, you're making those cars either lose a lap, or if you're saying, oh, well, even if, if we lose a lap with them, then we, uh, we'll, we'll either restart them a lap down well, why should them ones be an, an entire lap down and not the rest of the people that, that previously they were challenging? But if you're going to say, well, we'll cancel that so that effectively they're, they're still um, listed as all being on the same lap, but just now in the right race order. Well, you've got the issues of these cars that have been allowed to fall back. Well, their tyres haven't had to cover that additional lap. Their fuel load has not had to change because of that additional lap that they've covered. So it, again, skews it for each of the competitors involved. So it's not a valid uh, option in any way. And that's why the rules are what they are. So I'm not interested in what you think and what your suggestion is, Martin. 
there's clear reasons as to why that's a, a stupid suggestion. It slows things down. As it happens, that would have cost Lewis Hamilton dearly back in him. As it happens, Martin's idea, which isn't real, which isn't a good idea, which isn't the rules of the sport, had that have been the case, that would have cost him dear in Imola earlier in the year. So this fake scenario you're dreaming up would have been was would have disadvantaged Lewis. But actually, because of that fake scenario not existing, somehow Lewis Hamilton therefore was advantaged. Is that right, Martin? Well, uh, when he was recovering from from an incident um, and other drivers in the past, but you know the lap runners are lap. Let them just fall back through and and put the leaders together like that and go and go racing again. So I think no, no, the lap runners are lapped. Lando Norris was still in a race with Pierre Gasly. Pierre Gasly was only a little bit up the road at that time of the incident. Lando was closer to Pierre Gasly than Max was to Lewis. Oh, let Lando just fall a lap back. Now he's a lap behind. It he doesn't matter. Okay. He doesn't matter. Just let Max race Lewis. Why? Why should that be okay? Why should we let just just one guy that was further apart, you know, further behind Lewis than Lando was behind Gasly, let's just let Max race Lewis, but let's forget about Lando against Pierre. Ridiculous. There are a number of solutions. Michael Massey is relatively new to it, the race director. <laughs> Three years in the role, okay, he took over, start of the 2019 season. He'd done an apprenticeship year be before that, where uh, he was the understudy alongside, uh, I believe it's Scott Elkins. So, should have been, at the races that he was actually there with Charlie, you know, probably half the season. The other half the season, he should have been involved in debriefs with the other two, with Charlie and Scott Elkins. So... There's a year as your apprenticeship year. Then he's taken over as race director. Okay. I can give you the statistics of the number of events he has been the race director of or involved in race direction. Okay. Been party to that. It's significant. It's somewhere in the region of 80 events when you count that apprenticeship year. That's significant. Lots of safety car deployments. I think it was in excess of 64 safety car deployments, of which 16 of them involve lapped cars. I believe this was might have been the 17th race where it involved lapped cars and the unlapping of lapped cars. That's significant. That's not a novice. You don't give the job to a novice that has got no prior experience. You don't say we're now we've now come to the world cup final of cricket of rugby of football oh we 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 don't know we don't know who the referee is we'll just get this we we'll get this 15 year old kid who's never done it before we'll give him a chance shall we citing lack of experience is utter mm, rubbish rubbish now, Charlie Whiting, who wrote these regulations, knew them inside out. Oh, so Charlie wrote him, so he knew the rules, but he died. So um, none, of, none of the rest of us know the rules. Yeah, the, the rest of us are confused. One, we don't know. We don't know why he wrote them the way they are. He he knew, but we don't really. That's what you're trying to convince people of, aren't you? That's what you're trying to do. And was strong with teams. They feared him in terms of they didn't mess around with Charlie and anybody. As any official of any sport should be. And if you're not strong and you're not capable of that, you're not good enough to be an official of elite level sport. Simple as that. Everybody who does this job needs to have that kind of control over very very competitive people on the pit wall. I personally do not like to hear teams working away on the referee effectively saying, hey, don't put a safety car out now. You know, that is absolutely out of order. And, and that needs to stop where you can, you can start putting, so, you know, Massey 
is trying to handle a car in the barrier, a truck on the track, clearing the car away and marshal. And people love being him as to whether he should or should not let the let the right. So look at the way he's presented that. Toto Wolf uh, lobbied Massey during the race when I think it's Jovanazzi's car was breaking down and um, breaking down on track. And we saw the radio footage of uh, Toto Wolf communicating with Massey, trying to say, try, you know, this, you shouldn't use a safety car to deal with this incident. This should be a, a virtual safety car. Now, Number one, should any of the um, any of the team managers, the team directors, such as Wolf or Horner, be telling the race director how they should handle them situations? No, they shouldn't. So I'm not going to defend Toto Wolf in that in that situation. However, what I will say is this: what we had all witnessed over the course of the season and in the run-in to Abu Dhabi, those last three or four races, we had seen the true nature of race control. We had seen Michael Massey um, asking Red Bull if he, if they would be okay with him starting Max in third position. Would that be okay with you, Red Bull, if I uh, restart this race with Max in third? Is that okay? They could tell that he was having his strings pulled by Red Bull. So they would have been extremely wary of going, oh, for God's sake, don't put the safety car out now because this doesn't need that. Okay? Was they right to do that? No, they're not. But by the same token, when you're involved in participating in sport, when your team is, you do try to, to counteract some of the things that you're up against. And that was one of the things that they're up against. So Brundle then leads this by saying you can't have people onto the race director saying that and then goes in to and there's a car in the barrier having crashed. Okay, Wolf wasn't saying don't put the safety car out to the Latifi incident. So don't try and confuse the two. Wolf was saying, Giovinazzi's incident doesn't need to be a safety car. That can be cleared up under virtual safety car, which it could, which it was. The Latifi crash was a requirement for the safety car. That was different. Okay? Wolf didn't try and convince him not to put the safety car out there. So don't try and present it any any other way the cars the lapped cars go through or you know whether or not he should even throw a safety car so we just rewind that. when go through him a truck on the track clearing the car away and marshal and people lobbying him as to whether he should or should not let the let the cars the lapped cars go through or you know whether or not he should even throw a safety car as we had earlier on when Giovanazzi broke down on the side of the track and didn't park particularly close to a service access. So, uh, that looks nasty. Oh. Oh, that's an interjected advert. Oh, and it's a red car! Uh, that is wholly unacceptable, uh, in my view, that, that teams from the pit wall can lobby effectively the referee. OK, so the example you've, you've given is Toto Wolf. Um, suggesting lobbying whether or not to throw the safety car in a situation. How about highlight this notion of telling the race director to just release a few cars or telling the race director that he doesn't have to let them go all the way around the track to catch the back, just, just release them and then they've got a race on their hands. Then we've got a motor race on our hands. Is that right, Jonathan Wheatley? Right? How about that is the most unacceptable part of that? Because that is the bit that actually goes against sport in fairness for every competitor. That is the bit that just solely sets this up for Max Verstappen. 
No mention of that, Martin. No mention of that whatsoever. Yeah, very fair point. I must say those, those viewing figures that you just said, Martin, absolutely superb. You and the rest of the Sky Sports F1. So that's all it's about, really, isn't it? Them superb viewing figures. Look at all the eyes on all of those fancy brands, all of those potential customers for all of those brands. That's worth a lot of money, isn't it? That's worth a lot of money for the, the marketing and, and these companies that, that, that present all this. Look at all the money involved in that. Absolutely incredible. One team are just brilliant. And one of those people is, is Anthony Davidson, who we spoke to about an hour ago. And I'm going to ask you the same questions I asked to him. Uh, how Lewis Hamilton has come out of all of this as a, as a person, really, because he's acted with class and dignity uh, since things didn't go well for him. He's not celebrating that eighth world title, but he was so gracious after that. And he could, he, he could have been completely the opposite and he wasn't. How good does he look? <sighs> Again, leading questions, okay? Leading questions. And, and did you need, really need to paint such a picture? Or could it just have been a quite straightforward question? Well, it's not just Sunday, is it? I've known Lewis, I first met him when he was 13 years old, and I think he's uh, always acted with class and dignity, and he's a very fair driver on the track, and he's had to get his elbows out a little bit because Max Verstappen has turned up with a, a more aggressive style than perhaps we've It's not a more aggressive style. It's a style that breaks the rules of no motorsport. It's not acceptable. In previous years, it would have been called out. In different eras, other drivers, I am confident, would not have tolerated it. I get the impression from old footage that I've seen that drivers of the ilk of somebody like James Hunt would have got out the car and probably give him a good smack at the end of a race for driving like that, for attempting to drive him off the track. Wouldn't have tolerated it. This this crash or or burn approach that he has not acceptable. But again, none of the sports commentary team call that out. Instead, they validate it, and you continually validate it. You're continually presenting Max Verstappen as being this amazing great, which he really is not. He really isn't. Yes, he can make his car go fast round a lap. But being a motor racing driver is not that. OK, being a time trialist is that being a motor and, and Max, when he hasn't got to go wheel to wheel, wheel racing with other cars, if he's got a car that is faster than everybody else. Yes, he can lap it very fast and he can continually lap it fast. That's fine. But if, if he is in a similar paced car to other drivers, does he have the craft to actually make legal overtakes, to actually track another driver down, force them into making mistakes so that he can make motor racing passes? And I haven't seen that at all throughout his career. And to be a great motor racing driver, you have to have that ability. And I've not seen that in Max. But nobody says that in this sport. These people don't. Instead, they just say, wow, you're seeing one of the all-time greats here. That's not how it is. And anybody that knows anything about motorsports knows the truth of this. We've seen in Formula One of recent years. So um, Lewis handled it well. His dad was there. And I'm sure, you know, uh, Lewis could have been celebrating 10 world championships. Uh, on Sunday, had he not have gone into the, you know, a, a slippery pit lane in China, two thousand seven, or were the rules broken? Did 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 the rules of the sport prevent Lewis from winning that championship? Not that I'm aware of. You know, it wasn't it wasn't that that lost him that championship. An engine blow up in Malaysia, two thousand. Were the rules broken? No. Two thousand sixteen, or he might have lost in two thousand and eight. It had it not rained quite so hard. <laughs> had the weather have been different, he might not have won one. <laughs> what, what are you saying? Right? So all of these balance it out with having one cheated from him. 
Yeah? Utterly ridiculous. Hard in the final laps in Sao Paulo, you know, uh, it's the it's the way it goes. Um... <laughs> no, no, it's not the way it goes. Them things don't balance out. This is entirely different. This is the entire sport contriving it against him and contriving it for Max Verstappen to win it. It's not the way it goes. It's nothing to do with the way it goes. This is fixed. And I, I can understand why he would feel aggrieved. He's been so fast in the final stages of this season. Unbelievably so. But they both absolutely deserve that title. You, you, you don't deserve, right? You win by accomplishing the set criteria. That being, over the course of the season, you've got to accumulate the highest points total. And were he not cheated out of that, Lewis Hamilton did that. So he is the only deserving driver of the 2021 championship. You don't two people deserve it. Lewis accomplished that criteria. I can't say Verstappen didn't deserve the title. I, 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 I... Yes, I can, because he didn't. He was gifted it. I've got to write a column for Sky F1 at some point when I can get rid of some jet lag and find a bit of time. But, you know, Max led 652 laps this season. To... Absolutely irrelevant. OK, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. It's about points scored. You don't get a point for every lap you lead. You get a point for your finish. You get your points for your finishing position. OK, so the number of laps you led doesn't matter. Irrelevant. The Lewis is 303. It was 10 wins to 8, Max's favour. 18. OK, 10 wins to 8, Max's favour. Take away the Belgian parade, which was in no way a race. In no way a race. There was a two-lap staged parade behind the safety car to give the global exposure to all of those brands, all of those sponsors on the cars, and to ensure they didn't have to refund fans. OK, so it was a marketing thing. There was no sport taking place. No racing took place. No overtaking was, was able to happen. It was no sport. It's like a football match taking place where two teams walk out onto a pitch, it raining, and just stand there for two minutes. Maybe just not even really kicking off because kicking off would be a start of the competition. All right? Just stand there for two minutes and then go, no, nah, it's, it's too wet to play here at the moment, isn't it? Right, we we can't play today. Game over. Oh, let's just let's just say um, let's just say Liverpool win that one. What? That's that's not sport, is it? That's what happened in Belgium. So that wasn't a race. So this ten to eight. Well, you take away Belgium. That's only nine eight. But that nine eight includes Abu Dhabi. And Lewis won that. If the rules of the sport go. So it's actually 9-8 to Lewis, not 10-8 Verstappen. Ridiculous. In 17, his favour on the podium. Uh, but actually, I'll go back to that 9-8 point. Even that is irrelevant. OK, it shows a level of what you've accomplished. But all that matters is who has accumulated the highest points tally. And we'll always come back to that. Would have been Lewis Hamilton. Would have been, you take away, well, you can take away Belgium. You take away the five extra points that was gifted for Verstappen because he was gifted 12 and a half points for that event. Lewis was gifted seven and a half points. So you can take both of them, them amounts of each of them driver's titles, meaning that Hamilton goes into Abu Dhabi actually five points ahead of, of uh, Verstappen. Right? And then Lewis wins it. So either way, Lewis is the 2021 champion. Simple as that. And he left 15 of the 22 races of the season leading the world championship, including the last seven. So, whoopee do. What does that matter? It's irrelevant. All that matters is who ends the season with the highest points total. And had the rules of the sport not been broken 
and had this not been contrived the way it was, that would have been Lewis Hamilton. You cannot argue against that. That was what was ha would have happened. You know, Verstappen did a great job. Hamilton's comeback with Mercedes Benz was. Verstappen did a great job. Hamilton and uh, Mercedes did a great job. So it's not just Hamilton, it, it, it's Mercedes doing the great job there against Verstappen doing the great job. Yeah, oh, thank, thanks for that, Martin. Because that's what we're getting at the moment. Oh, Verstappen is brilliant. Verstappen is brilliant. Oh, but, but, but it's the others, the others are their teams. But it's just Verstappen. You're not mentioning how, how that Red Bull car is light years ahead of every other car. It's all about how good Verstappen is, isn't it? was sensational and either of them you, you kind of want to give them both the world championship but you can't and that's how it played out on Sunday and I think it's time to move on now and that's how it played out on Sunday and I think it's time to move on now and that's how it played out on Sunday and I think it's time to move on now and and this is less than 24 hours after the event and you think it's time to move on now and you think it's Time to move on now, do you, Martin? Less than 24 hours after the most controversial event in sport, in sport, not just the sport of Formula 1, in sport, and you think it's time to move on now. You're trying to say to people, yeah, we don't want this resolved in a court. You think it's time to move on now. Just accept this and move on now. Why would that be? Why would that be? Would that be because actually... When this comes out in the open, when this is fully exposed, when the true level of corruption is exposed to everybody, not just the 760 people that follow my channel that now get it. I'll say that they now will get it. There's you know, a few of them that are trolls that never will. OK, but when this true level of corruption is truly exposed, where do you think that's going to leave you, Brundle? Where do you think that's going to leave you? I intended this to be a short one. Clearly, I'm not very good at making um, short, snappy videos, but uh, that's that's the way it is. I'm going to do similar ones for the other propaganda films that Sky produced at the time. All right, because there are at least four or five examples that I can break down like this and they're all significant. They're all significant because they all took place in between the race and when the FIA published its report. OK, so they're the, the ones that I'm going to focus on in the next few videos to expose what Sky were were trying to condition people to believe during those two months. It's hugely significant and it shows you the role that they're employed to do. Thanks for tuning in. And hopefully it won't be too long before the next one. Cheers.